Hello everybody and welcome to this video which is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. And this week we're just very quickly updating the meeting Drax action. Again, this is something that you've seen updated before, but it's a relatively easy text field. And as you can see, I'm just going to remove the tour of Portsmouth because that's done. There'll be another one coming up soon, but I'll include that when it happens. And we're going to put in my mini trip to the USA. It's only 10 days or so, uh, which is actually happening as of the time that this goes live in about a week. So sorry for the short notice, but it's taken a while to get everything sorted. And as you can see, there are a few little bits that are still classified. So they will be updated as and when appropriate in the next few days. But the things that are pretty much locked in at this point are on the 20th of February, I'll be at USS Kidd at Baton Rouge. 21st of Feb, I'll be at the Pensacola Naval Aviation Museum. On the 22nd of February, the Mariners Museum in Norfolk. If you happen to be an officer or cadet at Annapolis, then I'll be at US Naval Institute on the 23rd of February. Um, probably not too many for that one. Uh, and then on the 24th of February, there's a special event at USS New Jersey. So look up their website for that. And just like that, the page is there. So if after all these little mini tutorials I've been doing, you think you could build a website for maybe ideally naval history purposes, but you never know, you might want to do it for some other reason, then head over to squarespace.com forward slash Drakenafel. You can get a free trial, and once you're ready, that little link will give you 10% off your first website or domain. So thanks once again to Squarespace for sponsoring the video, and on with the main show. Hello everyone, and welcome to another video. Uh, you will hopefully recognize this wonderful returning gentleman um, <laughs> from our conversation about the Punic Wars a few months ago. Uh, it is, of course, Brett Devereaux. So we are going to discuss something that's not strictly just naval history. Um, in fact, we're going to discuss uh, history in general and how it is kind of working these days, or maybe how it should work. Because or is it working? Yeah, or is it working? Well, that's that's the big question, isn't it? Because we've on, on in the broader field of academia, YouTube, etc., there's arguments and questions pinging back and forth between various parties and of course um you know in some ways we're to the, the two sides of the coin but in other ways we don't but we both do cross over because of course you know i i do re you know, primary source research and write books uh which is more the traditional academia route of things but i'm primarily on social media you of course are a, a lecturing proper <laughs> historian as it were um but you also have a a uh a presence online as well um so uh we, we thought we'd have a, a discussion and uh obviously most mostly it will be uh, our guest but i'll chip in occasionally on yeah academia social media and history and how it, how that's all going at the moment so i guess uh starting off with our, our first question now, obviously, situations vary in different countries. So some of our listeners in Australia or mainland Europe might have a different experience. But at least as far as the English speaking academic world is defined, which would, OK, I'm fair enough, that would actually include Australia. But um, especially you just have to flip the letters upside down. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the, obviously the UK and the US. What are the current problems that are being faced by humanities departments? Because that's where history resides at universities um, in the academic world. Yeah, I think this is the the right place to start this conversation because a lot of, I mean, especially the kind of social media conversations that I think we're responding to here to understand both the logical place that the academics are coming at this, but also the emotional place that they're coming at this, that you have to know what's going on to the academic field of history, um, which is nothing good. So the I'm most familiar with the statistics for the United States and Canada, which have essentially one academic job market between them, but that's the largest English speaking academic job market by far in the world. So it, you know, it, it has broader effects and there's similar sorts of things happening in the UK and and um, so on. Um, and and the basic statistics, they, they run it thusly um, through about 2007. Um, you can actually see the AHA, the American Historical Association, uh, collects these statistics. You can see that academic jobs in history and the number of of history PhDs granted year by year largely tracked. 
In 2008, they diverged. History hiring fell by roughly half um, from what had been the previous level, and it subsequently never recovered. Um, every year since 2010 would have been one of the worst years between 1970 and 2010. Um, the result is that history departments uh, are shrinking, um, and they're shrinking quite radically. One recent study of departments in the, the Middle West in the United States, the average department had shrunk by 30% over the last 10 years. If the current hiring trend continues, you should expect to lose roughly half of the academic discipline of history over the next couple of decades as the retirements set in. So we are a field very much in crisis, a field that is radically shrinking. And then that produces impacts that hit all sorts of people in the field differently. Um, for the folks that do have permanent academic positions, which is not me, um, you know, the problem they face is smaller, diminished departments. Um, the administrative load of those departments hasn't declined, so it's compressed onto fewer and fewer people facing fewer and fewer resources with less research support. And now forever worried that their departments will be further shrunk or God help them abolished. Um, for those of us without permanent academic jobs, the placement rate for new history PhDs in the United States declined from something like 70% in 2007 um, to something like 10% for my cohort. So you go into grad school, you put in five to seven years getting a PhD, you have a one in 10 chance of actually getting a permanent academic position. Um, and so I think that kind of crisis is the necessary context for understanding um, both a real push among historians to get involved in what they'll phrase as public outreach or public engagement, um, any kind of public communication, um, but also, I think, a prickliness um, with folks doing public facing history. Um, because, you know, there really is, uh, you know, frankly, this kind of catastrophe and, uh, it, you know, and, and if I can add, because I think one of the things, and, and I'm sure we'll come back to this, that I get when I bring this up on social media is a lot of people are like, well, who cares? I get my history on YouTube. Why do I need, you know, academic historians? Now you do primary research, but I'm going to be honest, most history folks on YouTube don't. And that's fine. That's not what everybody you know needs to be doing. Someone needs to communicate with the public. But the fact is that most of of the the history material that folks are getting on channels like this is not primary research. It can't be um, because primary research takes forever and it's expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and so most of those channels are reliant on the primary research produced in academic departments, which is the only real place in our society that history research of that kind happens in quantity. And so as those departments shrink, the sort of flow of new history information um, shrinks with it because, and, and I'm sure you can attest to this, right? The, the task of primary research is slow and painstaking. Um, history does not come to us as data it comes to us as evidence, and that evidence is confusing and difficult. You have to pile through reports and archives that are often confusing and contradictory and you know, often not in languages that are commonly read. I mean, obviously, I work on the ancient world, so all of my stuff is in Latin and Greek. Um, <laughs> and, and so that someone needs to be doing that process, and that engine in our society is breaking down. Um, and that's as true in the United States as like, I, I am less familiar with the statistics, but I will tell you my colleagues in the UK say, if anything, it is worse over there. Yeah, I, I would back that up. I mean, obviously, people who watch the channel know I, I got my degree in, in engineering. However, um, what fewer people are probably aware of is that when I started looking for degrees, my, uh, shockingly, I actually wanted to get a degree in history or something to do with you know, the maritime environment but in a 
potentially slightly unusual move for someone who was 19 at the time. Um, I actually or apparently did what the sensible thing of when I went to all the open days for the courses, I asked the uh, professors, well, you know, I'm going to invest so much time and money into getting this degree. What are the chances of me getting a job in that field at the end of it? And I went through my list of preferred subjects to study and you know the history based it most of them were saying well honestly five ten percent chance if you're lucky um one said 15 but they said 15 percent if you come i won't name the university in question but they said 15 percent chance of getting a job if you go on to do at least a master's ideally a phd and you come back to within the same institution that you study at um so essentially taking advantage of contacts you'd make while you were there um otherwise he said yeah probably five six percent and I, I basically went down my list of entries until i got to an engineering course where they had actually probably about 95 percent chance of getting a job in and i was like oh, okay that sounds good and off i went um and that was 2004 so right. even before this this hit in in the us um and i think what you what you said about the prickliness i it almost what immediately came to mind was a um sort of the african savannah watering hole situation of like the, uh, as the water hole shrinks, the, the, there's just as many th uh, creatures trying to feed from the water hole. The water, as the water hole shrinks, more conflict arises. <laughs> um, but also, yeah, I mean, I think we'll, we'll come come on to a little bit more about what you were saying about you know the, the research and where where people have to get their information yeah. from. That's something we'll talk about um, perhaps a little bit further down the line. But what coming on to the next question, just for a minute, what do you? why do you think this particular situation has arisen i mean immediately to my mind when you said 2008 2010 the first thing that flashed to my mind was the big economic crash we had then of course um but it sounds like it's continued yes um so first i would i would be remiss as a history instructor if i didn't note that at least in the united states the economic outcomes for history bas are fine um we'll come back to this but a lot of of this sort of this discipline or that discipline at the undergraduate level, at the bachelor's level, is based on vibes and is not backed up by the data. Um, apart from you know, uh, a, apart from a handful of highly technical degrees, it often doesn't actually matter all that much what your BA is in, in terms of your five tenure economic prospects. Mm -hmm. um, that's what the the data tells us. Um, but people think that this degree sounds employable and that degree doesn't. I mean, in some cases, they're just like really wrong. Like political science sounds employable. And like, yeah, it's about the same as history. And you're learning mostly the same different methods. Like they're different fields, but there's not as huge a gap as people as people often think. Um, so it is it is OK to major in history, though, as I, I always tell my students, if you're worried, double major. Um, which is what a lot of my students, a lot of the history students now, they have a double major, um, one major in history and one major in whatever it is their parents think they're paying for. Um, <laughs> I like that. And, and um, but yeah, so so why the situation? So the proximate cause is, as you know, right, the financial collapse caused a freeze in university hiring across the United States. That came in the context so that humanities, broader humanities crisis had been going since the late 90s. Um, and history had been resistant to it. Our enrollments hadn't declined and our hiring hadn't stopped. And, and in 2006 and 2007, we were congratulating ourselves of not going the way of English and classics. Um, the financial crisis hits and um, our hiring contracts and there is a renewed emphasis on STEM is the term that gets used. Um, which is science, technology, engineering, mathematics, although it also seems to, the E could also be economics and the M could be management because somehow business, like the B doesn't fit there, but it's in there in terms of the funding. Um, and ironically, putting math in STEM, uh, the mathematicians I know joke that when it when the university brags about its STEM fields, they're the M in STEM. And when it <laughs> comes time to get funding, they're the M in humanities. Um, yeah. Math departments are in trouble. Theoretical math, they they have all the same problems we do, um, which is not great. Um, but so there was this renewed emphasis on STEM and universities began cutting back more aggressively on the humanities. At the same time, we see 
students who seeing the sort of the great recession felt like they needed a marketable degree. Um, and again, this is mostly based on vibes, but university administrators largely quote the vibes to their students who accept that as statistics when it isn't, and then major based on that. And so it became hard for history programs to retain counts of majors. Enrollments stabilized. We were able to keep enrollments, like they dipped and then they stabilized. We had the same number of students in our classes, but fewer majors, which was then in many universities used as an excuse to cut history programs. Um, and, and administrators will often, university administrators will often say that this is a cost saving measure. Um, I think uh, Clifford Ando over at the University of Chicago, I think, had a white paper about this like a couple months ago that is going to be a chronicle of higher education article at some point in the near future, pointing out how bonkers the financial reasoning here is. Um, for folks who may not kind of grasp the economics of the of the university, your professors are not all paid the same. Hmm. Um, you know, your biology professor is probably paid a couple in the U.S., uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Your economics professor is probably paid a couple more hundred thousand dollars. And your history professor is probably paid about 80 grand at a top tier state school, um, like a like a UNC or a Berkeley. Um, so you can hire a lot of history professors who can teach a lot of students for not very much money. So these cuts to the humanities never solve much in terms of the financial problem. But it has to do with what's being valued politically and what's being valued by the administrators. Again, it's very much vibes. Um, but the result is is really sharp cuts. Um, and again, like the we're on course to shrink history as an academic field by about half. Um, and and I should note there there are in many cases even more dire situations for the rest of the humanities. As someone who studies the ancient world. Um, classics, right? The study of Greek and Roman antiquity um, is in much worse shape, much worse shape. Um, history departments shrink. Classics departments are abolished. There are, you know, the university I teach at right now has no classics department. It has two people to teach Greek and Latin in a language department, and that's it. Hmm. Um, and that is the normal situation in large U.S. universities that are not like ultra elite Berkeley, Harvard, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's the post-classics university. Um, you know, English departments never quite go away because you need someone to teach freshman comp. But what happens is that those departments shrink massively in terms of their permanent, what we call tenure line faculty. Those are people who are either tenured or could get tenure. And those are replaced by underpaid adjuncts sort of en masse. That's happening in history too. Um, I am one of those underpaid adjuncts. <laughs> um, like I don't have a, a permanent position, and and I will note that like the the hiring contraction has also produced like absolute absurdities in terms of the structure of the field as well. I have research in internationally top ranked journals. My book is under contract in the most prestigious possible publisher in my field. I have a large you know uh, uh, public profile. Um, and I'm in the academic version of the gig economy because there are no jobs. Um, it's a weird situation of realizing sometimes that the people on the hiring committee assessing you who were hired back in 2005, 2010, are like less qualified for their job than you are. <laughs> um, because, And that doesn't mean that they are bad. Uh, it just means they got hired when the system made sense. Um, and now it it doesn't. Um, it was kind of the, the, the sort of you know the classic, you know, we want to hire a twenty year old with ten years experience in the field situation. Yeah. Um, and since those don't exist, instead, um, the effect has actually been to intensify some pretty unfortunate trends in academic hiring, particularly the role of prestige. Um, and so a lot of academic hiring goes to the candidates from very elite universities, kind of regardless, frankly, of quality, which is its own sort of separate problem that we needn't get into here, but it is a real issue. Yeah. Um, 
So there are there are a number of threads I think that push into why this has happened. Um, the university sort of thread is is in turn connected to changes in the United States with how uh, public higher education is budgeted. Um, that state support for public higher education has collapsed. It has been replaced primarily with grant funding, which has created an emphasis on fields that can get grant funding. Um, the U.S. agency that funds science research has an $8 billion budget. The U.S. agency that funds humanities research is 1 50th the size. Um, at a little less than $200 million. And so this shift from states fund colleges to teach students to states don't fund colleges, so colleges subsist off of research funding to fill the gap, like that was always going to be very bad. For history, um, of course, the federal government could decide to fund history research, but it, it doesn't. Um, and, and there's a sort of similar... Um, Similar negative impact, in, as I understand it, in the UK, combined with the uh, oh, and I'm now I'm going to embarrass myself because I've forgotten the acronym, but combined with with the um, the UK's academic publishing standards that you need to meet the oh, it's a three letter acronym. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah I know the ones. Yeah, I know. Um, which has as well now. <laughs> yeah, which has very deleterious effects on on good scholarship because you just sort of have to hit the pace and so stuff has to come out before it's ready and so on because the standards were designed with the stem fields in mind where you know in those fields an individual scholar might churn out dozens of papers in a year as their research proceeds whereas you know in history it's it's pretty normal to hunker down for 3 4 5 years and then come out with a book at the end of it and that's been very productive um and and so this sort of emphasis, this kind of turn away from the humanities and towards STEM has been has been disastrous. And and it creates this reinforcing cycle because people hear how bad it is. And so then they don't want to do that in school. So your majors drop. So it gets worse. Um, yeah, I think I think there there there's what you said with the sort of the difference between STEM and, and history when it comes to output. There's. I've noticed that because obviously, you know, starting in engineering and coming over to the history side of things. Um, well, I mean, e even in engineering, it was very difficult to try and keep up any level of publication and hold down an actual paying job because uh, most of the your employers are just like, you know, you, you're you doing our work. You're not doing mm -hmm. separate work. You can maybe yeah. infer stuff from what you've they've done day to day, but uh, that's a separate issue. But um, yeah, I mean, I think the thing, thing is at least obviously – the S and the T parts and the M parts, maybe I'm not so familiar with, but at least from the engineering perspective, when you're working on something, you can publish a paper on what didn't work and what went wrong. And people will actually find that very useful because it stops them. It will prevent them going down that same line um, or they can use that to determine, you know, uh, I've, I've worked at, you know, I do something like, you know, I, I, was doing modifications to this bridge and i found this 1960s method of reinforced concrete actually is deteriorating really quickly and it's going to collapse in 10 years if we don't fix it that's that's a negative finding but for everyone who has bridges that were built in the 1960s that's really important but in history if you turn around and say well this is not how they fought this following battle <laughs> Nobody cares because we all knew that. <laughs> I went to the archive and I didn't really find anything all that interesting. Yeah, you can't. That article's yeah. not going to fly. No, no. Um, so I suppose that, that probably brings us on to um, as something you did mention a little bit in the first question. Is there this? Well, there, there probably is. But, you know, what, to what degree is there this perceived conflict between the traditional academic history uh, approach and the more public facing side of history, such as YouTube and blogs and other general social media that's grown up over the past decade or so. Yeah. And obviously, because I do both things, I mm -hmm. think they, they both have value. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that among the practitioners doing both things, there's there's sort of two kinds of, of of conflicts that arise. There's the very predictable conflict, which is um, 
a lot of the the public facing history uh, stuff that gets produced on social media on youtube and and what have you some of it is very high quality but you know this this program here <laughs> uh, but uh but beneath that right like there is a, a running river of garbage mm -hmm. um often you know poorly poorly put together but frequently incompletely researched if it's researched at all and trafficking in historical myths and and what have you often with really pretentious channel names right like in in invariably like the the channel name that is like some dude from wherever you realize that like that guy has a masters and and knows what he's talking about and then the channel that is like history documentary channel is like mm -hmm. made up of of three faceless people that have no idea what they're doing um i that distinction just is deeply amusing to me yes um and um and so naturally right like ac academic historians we see that stuff we're on social media and we complain about it because they're like that's not right that's not what the current scholarship says and, and so on and so that can create some some friction um I think the other source of friction has to do with um, credit and public understanding that history as a field, right? We are in crisis. We're like, what do we do? We need to be explaining to the public what our value is. And what we hear back when we try to do that, I've certainly heard this is, yeah, but why do I need history departments? I get all my history on YouTube. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, but if we didn't do what we're doing, then the guy you follow on YouTube has nothing to work with. Yeah, and um, I, I think that can't be emphasized enough because, um, you know, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to see if this works. I may drop something, but uh, let's see how it works. Um, so obviously, most people have seen this part of the library, um, but you know, there's this part and this part <laughs> and this part and this part. And this part and this part. <laughs> and, you know, it, 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 this is the main library. That's not counting the massive pile on the floor that there's not currently shelf space for, or the second room in the house that's currently in the process of conversion. And I mean, OK, admittedly, apart from that shelf over there, which is actually primary documentation I happen to own, um, all of these are, are books written by people who have done the primary research. So, you know, with the best will in the world, they are secondary sources. Right. But they've all been written. Well, not all. Most of them have been written by academics. Um, and the others that, that don't have, have, you know, written by people who have a long, creditable history of writing naval history books. And this is a lot of what I use when I'm making my videos. Without this and the other books around me, you know, a lot of, as yet, a lot of what I do, I mean, I could do it, but it would be much, much slower because of the having to go and look at all the primary, primary work myself. And helpfully, people, like, well, just, you know, Campbell, Johnston, um, Friedman, Nicholson, uh, you know, just picking some names straight off of there, of course, Burt, Parks, etc. They've done the work, a lot of the work for me. They've concentrated it all in a format where I can look at it and go, right, this is the bit that is will be interesting, hopefully, to everybody else. Um, obviously, you still need to cross-check to make sure that people agree, you know, basic research standards, and there's always going to be gaps to fill things in. Um, but, you know, if you, at least to my mind, if even when you're doing sort of a public side of history, if you're not referencing multiple different sources by different people and where necessary double checking it with the the primary reference material you can't really stand by anything you say if you didn't do that right you're not yeah and and of course you know i would also note that you know even for those of us who are are you know fancy pants academic historians engaged in lots of primary research you can't read everything and you can't know everything. So you're reliant on your colleagues and their production to sort of frame and understand what you're working on. Um, and then, of course, you have scholarly works that um, essentially sit entirely on top of other research. Um, you know, this is for my field because I, I work heavily with archaeology. It's very common to sort of, OK, you have 100 site reports that individually may not be 
remarkably interesting, but perhaps if you put them all together, you can come up with something interesting. And then if you put a bunch of those studies together, you can come up with a sort of conclusion that is then broadly applicable. And so like this whole process is a sort of a pyramid constructed at the base on people working directly with the primary material. And and then, of course, the second response you get is like, well, don't we know everything about the past? Which is like, oh, my, no. <laughs> no. Um, and, um, you know, not only obviously is one new minute of history made every minute, um, but also we ask new questions of the past. Even this is true, even when you're like me and you're working on, you know, right, the rise of Rome has been a historical question for 2,150 years. Um, all the way back to Polybius. But we ask new questions about it. And then you have to go back to the primary source material to answer those new questions. And so this is a continuing process by which evidence is converted into knowledge. And then that knowledge can be disseminated. And you know, some folks doing public facing work do both the knowledge production and the dissemination. Some people are all on the knowledge production side. Some people are all on the dissemination side. These are all important. But where I think the friction comes in is that you get a lot of folks who are on the dissemination side who they don't really discuss their sources. They don't really interview the academics that are doing the research. And so it gives a sort of impression of like, all the history I need is from this guy mm. on YouTube. And you know, mm. um, if our field collapses, that guy has nothing for you. Yeah. And, um, and, and then, you know, for the people who think, you know, oh, like you said, oh, don't we know everything about that? Absolutely not. I mean, you know, okay, people might forgive the fact that, okay, after 2000 years, our knowledge of Rome is a little bit spotty. But to be honest, you know, even going forward, I mean, you you think about stuff that's really well known in the naval history, Pearl Harbor, there's still an ongoing debate as to what color USS Arizona was painted on the day of Pearl Harbor. You'd think like, this was an era where color photography existed. It existed. And there's plenty of photos of her. There's still an argument. And the answer is probably she wasn't one color or another. She was probably part way through. But how far part way through? Who knows? And and weirdly enough, on the subject of paint colors, um, if you skip back a hundred or so years to the age, age of sail, um, the Battle of Trafalgar, you know, there's probably been entire forests demolished to write books about the Battle of Trafalgar. We still don't know what most of the French and Spanish ships were actually painted as. Huh. We know two of the Spanish ships had black hulls, specifically because people wrote down, this is weird, these two Spanish ships have black hulls. We're Which tells you sure they didn't to... normally have black yeah, hulls, so you can't exactly. extrapolate. Um, we, we're fairly sure the whole red striping on Santissima Trinidad was definitely a thing. But outside of that, um, you know, we know what the British fleet was painted as, because they'd all adopted the Nelson Checker, but... The Franco uh, Spanish fleets didn't adopt uniform paint patterns until about four or five years after Trafalgar. So there's a good chance they were vaguely recognizable, but not entirely. Um, which suddenly it makes a whole lot of sense why people traveling under w w without having their flags up, people would be like, I wonder who that ship belongs to. Because there wasn't a uniform, a literal uniform for, for those ships. And you go forward to, you know, something like the War of 1812 and you you get some paintings where um you have yeah and this is really weird because i've uh, you know um actually today the day of recording released the video on constitution versus guerrier and there's Ooh, paintings watch that. of that of that battle where both ships are in the black and yellow that the royal navy was using there's paintings where both ships are in the black and white of the US Navy and the Royal Navy, which would ad be adopted later in the 19th century, but wasn't the case. And there's ones where you've got constitution in the white and black and Guria in yellow and black. And they're all relatively contemporaneous to the period, you know, within 10, 20 years of that engagement occurring. Um, and, and I mean, fortunately, in that case, we actually do know what both sides look like. Right. But but if you had someone just going, oh well, we already know everything. Here's a painting. Paintings. It's like, well, and and you know, and the colliery to that is the way that Victory ended up getting yellower and yellower and yellower as she got painted during the 20th century. Oh, that in I didn't know. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, that's entirely due to tobacco smoke. 
because when they <laughs> um when they when they took out all the paint layers they discovered her her actual trafalgar era paint is this kind of very pale ochre yellow which to be honest from an aesthetic point of view the nice bright yellow looks better but the best theory as to why everybody thought the nelson checker was this really bright deep yellow is because all the old paintings when they're done they've got varnish put over them they're probably the period ones are about the right color the ones that have been preserved very well like turner's famous painting are the right color most of the others probably still are but in the 19th and early 20th century when no one cared about indoor smoking that varnish has gradually darkened over time and it's acquired a yellow tobacco stain which gives mm -hmm. all the pale ochre yellow a nice deep yellow and so even though those paintings might have been done within five years with people looking at the ships in question, if you looked at those paintings now, you went, well, this is clearly the colour that they were. And so therefore we must paint it this nice bright yellow. Also a great reminder about how long it took navies to standardise even basic things. Although mm -hmm. I will admit that the French and the Spanish are being terribly clever to wait until after Trafalgar to standardise their paint job when they will have fewer ships to paint. Yes, this is true. Um <laughs> So uh, vaguely trying to cut the steer back on top of right. the, paper, the, the paint colours of various ships. Um, now, the interesting thing to me is, obviously, as we've said, there's this divide between, in, in some areas, between the academic history and the, I guess, the social media history. Was or is there perhaps still a similar divide between the traditional university and book publishing academia and historians who do TV or I guess these days streaming channels like you know Netflix or whatever work. Um, uh, is there that same divide? Was there that divide? Maybe has it reduced or, or what? There can be. Um, certainly the advice that I was given as a grad student is never do the history channel. <laughs> um, uh, though usually the concern there is that you're being brought in as a talking head and you're also going to probably advise them but you don't have any kind of approval over the final product. And I certainly know a number of, of historians frustrated at feeling taken out of context. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of a different relationship because I think, I think, I think history creators on the internet today and historians in universities can interact to a significant degree as peers. When you're working with Netflix or the history channel, like the producer is boss and, and you are paid help. Um, and, and, you know, the annals are full of, of history consults on movies complaining that they weren't listened to. Um, and then I guess whoever consulted on, uh, what is it? The 2004 Alexander movie, uh, which inexplicably <laughs> gets all of the props really right. Like the, the film itself is about mm -hmm. half, but like the props are really good. Like, how did they do? Okay. Um, but, um, oh, one should have heard the. The cries of despair and frustration at this new Napoleon movie mm -hmm. uh, from historians. Um, but um, but yeah, so I mean, there's sort of similar friction. I think what what has changed to a degree is that I think to at least some academics, um, you know, Netflix, the History Channel, one, you could engage with it or not. You could tune it out if you wanted to. And it didn't feel and I don't think this is true, but I think it feels this way to some people. It didn't feel like a parasite. Whereas mm -hmm. I definitely think some historians, they look at like the YouTube space and they feel like it, this is feeding off of my work, but gives me no credit as my discipline collapses. Now, I don't think that's the right way to look about it, but that is certainly some of the vibe. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't want to throw too much sand in the eyes of of tv based history because some tv based history can be quite good um but certainly as i've gotten older you know when you're a kid you're just like oh flashy explosions bang 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 rat tat tat um <laughs> uh battle 360 for example <laughs> um, uh, but, um <laughs> the as i've gotten older what i've noticed as, as certainly a, a difference is say if i do an hour-long video it's going to be pretty much an hour of me going from point A to point B, I mean, you know, constant, near constantly talking. So there's a fair amount of material you can pack in there for reference for people who are interested. An hour long video is about 15 pages of A4 um, for me. Yeah. It, 
with the best will in the world, given that an hour on TV will be 15 to 20 minutes of ads, and usually each segment after the ad is a 30 to second to a minute recap of what happened in the previous segment, just in case you have the memory of a goldfish. Um, and you, it's like, you know, dramatic sentence, 30 seconds of CGI visuals, other dramatic sentence. When you actually compress it down, oh, even yeah, a it's, one it's hour documentary, good. you get maybe 10, 15 minutes of actual statements. Um, once you eliminate the duplication, which isn't a huge amount. And I suppose, you know, people could come away from that feeling, well, they know something about what happened, but not a lot. Whereas perhaps if someone, you know, if they get four times the content in the same amount of time, they're going to feel a lot better informed, which to be fair, they probably are. But it's that kind of, it's that iceberg problem of you, you've seen the tip of the iceberg. Uh, no, yeah, there's like 90% of it. Yeah, story. right. There's a lot more. Of this stuff. No, yeah. I think that's true. And I actually think, you know, one of the things, this is something I try to explain to my colleagues is that, I mean, for as much as there is kind of, a, a, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of garbage. Um, you know, some of the, the leading sort of folks making public facing, you know, history stuff on YouTube and what have you do represent just a tremendous improvement over your sort of history channel stuff. Um, I mean, you know, obviously your channel is, is very rigorous. I think it's something like uh, military history visualized mm. um, is very, very rigorous and, and very careful. Um, even, um, I mean, shoot, um, uh, 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 Todd Todashini's uh, mm -hmm. channel, right, does yeah. experimental <laughs> archaeology work with, with pre-modern weapons. Um, you know, some of the projects he's done, particularly he brought on Toby Capwell for a couple of videos on on longbows. That is some of the best experimental archaeology work on longbows and armor penetration that anyone has done, scholarly or non-scholarly, in any setting. I have cited that in peer-reviewed articles. Oh, he'll be uh, very happy to hear that because uh, I, I was there. Uh, if I move the camera up again, oh goodness, there, there's there's right at the top there. The oh top wow, one. that's my uh participation arrowhead in fact in one of the one of the little sub videos you can see me switching one of the targets out it was a very well, fun day or well, two days if, actually, if, but yeah. if if you if you meet todd i've only ever i've sent him like an email or two mm. but if you meet him you could tell him, yeah i his, some of his videos are are um cited in in my article on on roman mail armor in in chiron and several of his videos are in the bibliography for what uh, will eventually be my book. Um, You'll be very glad to know that. <laughs> no, I mean it's it. Look, it, it's it's good. It's good stuff, and it's and of course the support for the YouTube channel creates the space for that. Even as the research space in history is shrinking, though, I think this you know sort of the question is like, is history going to become like the crowdfunded research field? And here, as one of the tiny handful of people doing historical work that is that is fully self-funding that like feeds me mm -hmm. um no <laughs> uh you know i you know the the my research and the roof over my head comes from patreon more than my teaching because adjuncts you know they pretend to pay us and we pretend to teach mm -hmm. um i do actually teach <laughs> um but um but the the scale uh, that you're working on there is is tiny. Um, I am absolutely bizarre as someone who is is able to sort of really focus on this and essentially make a living doing history to to the public. So is it is it enough to support a sufficient amount of primary research to maintain the field? It is not. Um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't really great work that happens in this space and certainly something that i am encouraging my colleagues like engage more with this um rather than you know sort of crossing your arms in a huff and and i will say there is more engagement with this especially if you look at younger academics in, in history there is a sort of awareness of like we need to reach out and we need to be engaged um and so the shield field is is moving but of course academic fields move very very slowly because you know, we're all terribly old. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think that sort of covers a lot in a lot of ways. It covers the the next question, which would be, what do you think the problems 
with the sort of approach of division are from the academic side and and that rolls into what the problems from the social media side which i think we've we kind of both mentioned those already in 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 passing and when in some cases in some detail and as you said you know um certainly from the looking at it from the social media side um you can get things like cults of personality where you know if a person sounds convincing enough they can sell you anything um uh you can get uh, on the flip side you can also get really bizarre situations like you know someone said something that a particular person disagreed with that particular person is very very driven uh, driven and you know riles up an internet hate mob and suddenly it's about some imagined slight and the whole thing goes goes you know downwards in a handbasket um which i mean okay you know infighting isn't exactly unknown in academia either but <laughs> no. um with the best will in the world you're you're less likely to get several thousand people sending you nasty emails death threats and working out where you live and threatening to come after your family in a debate between you know should polybius be taken entirely seriously or not right <laughs> um, compared to oh you said something we object to on the internet death mm -hmm. death to all you and your family for the next 10 generations um but but as you say, there's also the problem as you, um of you know some time some uh youtube channels tiktok Facebook, whatever, um, as well as you sometimes get cults of personality where someone's like, well, I say this and this is correct, and anyone who disagrees with me gets banned. Um, you also get um, people who think they understand and just don't, mm -hmm. but they're convinced that they do. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, you know I, I, as a, I've said before sometimes, as an engineer... I look at some of the uh, t hot takes and sometimes rather embedded takes on some parts of naval history, and I go, this fundamentally makes zero sense from an engineering perspective. It, reality does not work this way. Right. <laughs> but people are obsessed with, no, we have determined this because we've thought it through, because we are smart. And it's like, that, that's not how it works. The, no. There's direct evidence, like the laws of physics say that this is not how, not not what what goes on. Um, and then you know, you get the people who are just like, I I read this um, at some point, or I have chosen to infer or believe this, or you know I found this one book by this one guy who said this, right? And and therefore, and it, it's it's all nonsense. And then people who are just throw throw things at the wall, and they have no real semblance to reality. Um, uh, I mean, and that that ranges all from like giving completely inaccurate accounts of, of battles to mislabeling things to um sometimes it can just be an annoying as annoying as inaccurate visuals or um very very clickbaity titles um yeah. because i mean uh, yeah we if you if you exist on a world of social media you do have to make your title a little bit engaging to draw in the audience but there's a difference between you know making an interesting title making a play on words or something that is actually based in the reality and coming up with something like, uh, uh, you know, this this battle or this ship or this aircraft or or this person that changed the war or terrifying one weird trailers. trip, yeah, that that kind of thing. And it's just like that's fundamentally not true. Yeah, <laughs> you, you can immediately look at that and the picture that they've got, usually with a red circle and an arrow for no apparent reason. And, the reason, yeah, yeah, and it's just like that's not what happened. Nobody cared. It's like it was one interesting side part of a, a, a but everyone's like, oh, I must find out about this thing. So, yeah, there, there definitely are problems. And of course, you know, it's that sliding scale of regulation versus non-regulation. If you're if you're in the academic side, I suppose, if you continuously publish complete and utter nonsense, your colleagues are almost going to do the like shame, shame. Right. Well, there's <laughs> there's peer review. Right. Yes, so exactly. like we, academia which is the has way a, of saying shape. <laughs> yeah. Academia has a system, right? Like if I want to publish something mm. in a in a journal, like this is this is worth discussing, right? Like I send the journal here, like here is my article. And they don't like the editor looks at it, he decides mm. if or he or she decides if they like it. And if they think it's possibly suitable, they don't then run it. They send it out to several other experts in my field to get their feedback. 
Mm. So you need to make an argument that you can get past several other people with similar expertise. And, and that's often an iterative process where you submit and then you get reject and resubmit is the term, which is we won't take it in this form. You need to answer the criticisms the peer reviewers raise. And if mm. you can do that, then we'll run it. And so like that process, it isn't by any means perfect. No. Um, Various fields have had their replication crises, um, but it does work to a significant degree. Uh, and and this I will also note, because so much of, of sort of history YouTube is military history YouTube, one of the other things is I read it in a book, and I'm always like, was that book peer-reviewed? <laughs> yes. Um, because, Who published that book? <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, um, because if the book is is Cambridge University Press, then, yes, it was peer reviewed, Um, you know, Naval Institute Press peer reviewed. Um, On the other hand, pen and sword, maybe, maybe not more likely not than actually authors have to request peer review from pen and sword. Um, Pen and sword is one of those publishers where. Eighty percent of their products are crap, I'm sorry. (laughs) Um, but the remaining 20% are are gems and it's like terribly frustrating. <laughs> you want to tell people they can just ignore the whole press and you can't because every so often they publish something good. Um, but there's that that range. And um and you're often not as the sort of end user on YouTube, you're given no indication of where you are on that range. And mm. where the creator is on that range. Whereas, you know, in the academic space, we have sort of feedback systems, both peer review, which is pre publication review, and then, you know, all of our journals run book reviews. Um, and so, you know, if your book comes out in an academic press, then every journal is going to review it. And so anybody who's looking at it can quickly get a sense of is this accepted in the field or not? Um, is this part of a continuing debate? Is there a response I should read? That kind of thing, which can often, you know, be missed. And that's obviously this is a less formal form of engagement. Um, Mm -hmm. But part of this interaction is actually why I would encourage more, you know, credentialed academic historians to get involved. Like there is a public interest here. And so there's going to be this engagement is going to happen. And we can either be in it or not. And if we're in it, we, one, have the opportunity to kind of use that engagement to sort of turn the eye of the viewer towards our disintegrating field and ask for help, (laughs) Um, but also to engage with what is being said and, and produced to sort of put something out there. I mean, I think my, the, the biggest obvious kind of, I am going to make an intervention thing that I have written publicly have, has been my takes on Sparta, um, both my very long blog series and then a later foreign policy essay, which was a compressed version, both of which sparked considerable debate, we'll put it that way, <laughs> which is funny. I should say considerable public debate. Um, among scholars, nothing I'm saying is is meaningfully controversial. I, mm. I steered clear of all of the exciting debates because I didn't want to get bogged down into that. It was so funny to hear people uh see people react to the foreign policy article and and you know people online who are terribly invested in sparta are getting very angry at me at the same time that i got a nice email from stephen hodgkinson who is the sort of leading figure in the kind of the branch of scholarship that i am probably less inclined towards sent me a nice email like oh i saw the piece it was very good <laughs> <laughs> but um and, um, you know, but that was a situation where, right, there is a lot of dreck on Sparta that is out there that is not serious. I'm like, I'm going to do something serious and and engage. And uh, and I actually think that that has been very successful. It uh, indeed, some of my colleagues report that it is now quite normal when Sparta comes up in discussion that inevitably it's like it's like a countdown to when when something of mine gets linked. <laughs> um because people have it in their in their back pocket. 
Um, you know, you can see um, not all, by no means all of the sort of flared moderators on Ask Historians mm. are credentialed historians, but some of them are. Um, I know, for instance, the the sort of uh, uh, dawn of Greek warfare studies over there. Um, uh, he's Iphicrates, I think, on the on the forum. But that's Roll Kaninidak, mm. um, and he is a serious scholar of ancient Greek warfare. I'm one of the leading scholars of ancient Greek warfare, and sort of he's partly there to like I'm gonna set the record straight on some of this, um, and that kind of engagement can be really valuable. I mean, it's important as as academic historians not to come in and be like, oh, I'm going to tell you how it is kind of a thing, but to engage, be yeah. like, well, this is what the evidence says. And does that comport with what you think or not? Um, and uh-huh. and to set that out. Now, unfortunately, because of the way our field is structured, those are not skills we train um, mm-hmm. very well. The kind of style of writing we train is very technical and it's designed to be read by other historians. And this is something I think is changing and needs to change um, if we're going to have a field in 20, 30 years. And I think that's that actually brings it on quite nicely to something I was going to say, which is that when it comes to you know correcting popular misconceptions, you know, with with the best one in the world, if someone writes, you know, a six hundred page book that details, let's use the Sparta example, exactly why Sparta is not like 300. Um, it will be, it may be perfectly correct and everyone agrees with it, but the vast, vast, vast majority of the public do not have the time or the inclination to read a 600 page book. Whereas if either that scholar or they, someone they work with can go and do a blog series or a video series that is digestible to the general public and you know, you can literally title it why ancient sparta was not like the movie 300 that's right. enough interest um a lot of people will watch that and then if you can say well actually you know this is all based on this then people who are really you know, hopefully most people watching go oh, okay that actually makes sense and the people who want to double check it or the people who are really invested can then go on and say, oh, right, well, there's this additional stuff I can read in. My right, because you've cited, you've cited the book. You've pointed them in yeah. the direction of what where they need to go. Now, of course, the, the you, you missed the title opportunity there. I went with This Isn't Sparta, right, with the periods. Yeah, that's a good one. You're, yes. You're kicking somebody into a well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, exactly, it, it, exactly this point. And I think that we need to do we need to do more engagement and we need to recognize, I think, academic historians that. The creation of knowledge is an important task, yes, but packaging that knowledge once it once we've formed it out of the evidence into a way that that regular people can digest is also important. And right, we're not we're not monks mm-hmm. uh, toiling away for like the glory of God in our in our studies. Um, the goal is for this stuff to reach people. Um, if, if all that happens with your research is that it collects dust on the shelves of university libraries, you haven't achieved very much. And again, that is not to say there is no value in producing the sorts of books that only collect dust in university libraries. I have a chapter out just this month in um, a Brill companion on logistics and ancient warfare, hmm. which is uh, Brill volumes are famously expensive. This one is no hmm. exception. It is designed for university libraries. It is not obtainable by mortals. But its purpose is to serve as the foundation for future research. That's valuable because it will be built upon, frankly, because someone, honestly, in this case, it might also be me, um, will then check it out of the library and use it as the foundation to work on on something um, for the public. Uh, so all of these stages have value but we need to make sure we're reaching someone at the end. And certainly my push would be for academic historians to be more engaged and more visible at the end, because as it stands right now, a lot of the people over here at the end point are unaware that it starts with a historian in an academic department going through some archives, but it always starts there. Yeah, It can't and start any other way. I, I, I think that's, I mean, I've tried to reflect that the way my channel is built, I've said to a few people in the past, the way my channel is built is you've got the five minute guides. They're designed to like, are you interested in naval history or not? You might not know, but you might give it five minutes of your time. Okay. If you are, and you're a bit more invested, then you've got the Wednesday videos, half an hour to an hour, maybe an hour plus. So if you're now a bit interested, now perhaps you become more interested and there's a bit more information 
And then you're like, oh, okay. But so I was interested in that little bit, five minutes in a bit. And I was interested in that. So ah, but then these are the these are the books that are suggested to follow up in the video description. And then the idea is, okay, now if you are really, really interested in the subject, now you have a stepping stone point to leap off into, you know, because as I said, yeah, an hour video, 15 pages, um, a, a typical book that covers that subject in detail will be 200 or 300. Right. You know, there, there is no way, um, you know, pick one. Um, okay, so let, let's do this one because mainly because I can pull it out without dropping the whole shelf on my head. Royal Naval Air Service in the First World War. This one is, just clocking in at, um, of course, I would happen to pick one that doesn't have easily seeable page numbers. Wouldn't page it? numbers, right? Um, you see, what do I have to hand? Uh, oh, that's because I mean the appendixes. There you go, two hundred eighty. It's about two hundred eighty-three yeah. pages, not including appendixes. So at that point, even if I spoke really quickly, if I was to do an hour-long video on the Royal Naval Air Service in the First World War. I could get maybe, I mean, okay, there's there's a bunch of pictures in there as well, uh, which take up space, but I would I would estimate maybe I could get five, ten percent. Right. If I was really ambitious of that one book in in a in a Wednesday video. So if people want to know what the rest of that history is, they have to read the book and it moves on from there. Cause you know, if, if you think about um again, obviously using my library as a reference. Something even relatively simple like radar, radar in World War Two. There are some pretty good books on radar in World War Two that are your sort of three, four hundred page A4 or la a larger size mm. technical volumes, Norman Friedman style stuff. And that will give you a fairly decent amount of information. But even then, that's not even close to all the information there is, because then on top of that, you know, Admittedly, because someone linked me to a very, very heavy sale they were doing, I've got a bunch of Palmgrave Macmillan books, and I've got um, a, a volume that's just Royal Navy radar in World War II. Right. And that thing's like 900 pages long right? <laughs> for, for one service's use of one particular technology in one conflict. And even the, the, you know, their, bibliog their primary source bibliography is about 40 pages. So that the, even beyond that, there's still more to... To, to learn if you really want to get into the into it but um it, yeah it's kind of, as you say it, it's there, there's one end which is getting the public engaged kind of drawing them in and then expanding their field of view until they realize there's a whole lot more to learn right. but on the other hand someone's got to be at that other end you know reading the original technical documents and coming up with those nine hundred thousand page reference works on one right. particular niche technology as used by one particular nation in one particular conflict Right, which is going to be built on and built right. Those niche studies then inform the book on radar generally, which oh. then informs the was like it 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 built it built upwards. And of course, you also bring um, right scholars on to to talk to them about mm. their research. You know whether it is it is impressive scholars like John Partial or mm. mediocre scholars like me. <laughs> um, but uh, I think you know more about John than John Partial does about the Punic Wars. <laughs> probably true. Probably true. <laughs> Um, but I'm, I'm still, I, I'm, I'm eagerly awaiting, uh, uh, his, his, his next book. We chat mm -hmm. every so often. Um, and, yeah, definitely. Uh, 1942. No, that's going to be fun. Oh, it's going to be so good. Um, I am excited, but, um, but no, like it, it's very much a, 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 a building process where all of this stuff fits together. And, and again, just sort of taking the opportunity to kind of shout to the audience here that, that this is something that chances are whatever country you're in, if you're listening to this, your country is defunding this process, is is tearing this down and is is letting the institutions that produce this slowly rot. And that might be something to get interested in mm. um, going forward because, um, you know, you may or may not be interested in reading 900 page, you know, books. But if you're interested in a channel like this, you know the what produces the data that a channel like this runs off of that that is in decline right now and and quite badly so. Yeah, and then there's and the, the thing is, uh, you know, referencing again back to what something you said earlier, where people are like, oh, don't we know everything about this? No, 
Um, I mean, I, you know, I did I did my um, series on U.S. Navy fleet problems, for example, and luckily there's been a couple of really good manuscripts written about U.S. Navy fleet problems. Because trust me, if you go onto NARA and you look up the original documentation for the fleet problems, that's anything between 900 and one of them ran into three and a half thousand pages of documentation. You know, that's the work of months to collate down into what's actually relevant. Because, of course, a lot of it is reports from lots of different ships and lots of different admirals all talking about the same thing. So there's going to be a lot of repetition involved. Um, and... So I, I was lucky in that respect. I had people who had done the work so that I could reference and double check with the original documents where necessary. But having now started a kind of highlight series on corresponding with the Royal Navy fleet problems, um, well, there's two problems. One, no one's done a similar work for the Royal Navy fleet problems in the interwar period, um, which means you know that's going straight to Kew and Portsmouth and going, right, here's, I think, for 1929, it's about, 1800 pages and then going through and like for each exercise i must now distill all of this through straight through the process where because you know, i mean you could probably turn that into a book in and of itself but right. through that down into an hour's worth of of content um and you know maybe at some point in the future once i've gone through all the available documents i might do my own my own book or manuscript on Royal Navy fleet problems of the interwar period, just so it's there for other people to reference in the future. But that work, at least as far as I'm aware, has not been done across the board yet. And you, you know, if you ask Joe Public, you'd think that that kind of thing, which is relatively accessible, right. would have been documented, but it hasn't. Um, and even then, we've run into issues like, um, you know, the Luftwaffe, charmingly, seem to have managed to set fire to a portion of of those records. So we may not have. Right, all of them. You know, there there may be copies around there somewhere in in weird esoteric archives if there's enough digging, but it's very possible that some of the information for something that would seem to be fairly obvious that's happened in the 20th century and should be well documented is already gone. Um, and as, I think that's a, that's another thing, isn't it, with with academic research of that. Not only can records no longer exist where you think they should really have, exist or should be preserved. But sometimes you can end up finding out that perhaps there's a work that someone else has done 20, 40, 60, 80 years ago where they had access to a particular set of records, but the records that they had access to don't exist anymore. So you only have a secondhand account um, and that's that's it. And you just have to hope they were thorough. Um, and I, I think that extends all the way through, doesn't it? Because like in, in, in your area of specialization, how many of these sources are, well... I uh, like this guy wrote this about this <laughs> and I'm writing what he uh, a summary or a response to what he said about this and he lived 200 years after this event occurred so well, this is the this is the the first punic war that the hmm. the sources that Polybius relies on for the first punic war are Roman Fabius Pictor and a Sicilian Greek Philinus neither of whom survived we have Polybius we have what is essentially Polybius's quick summary of them hmm as an introduction into his discussion of the rise of Rome, right? The, his whole, the first Punic War is just book one in mm. Polybius, and it's not all of book one because he's just stage setting with it. But that's all we've got. Um, we don't have most, we don't have almost any Livy for this period. And then later sources, and this would have been true for Livy too, probably, are just giving us Polybius. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, you have, you have ancient sources that have access to other sources that no longer exist. I'm actually writing right now. Um, it'll go up later today, so it'll already be up by, you know, the time this yes. airs, obviously. But like this week, I'm, I'm looking at how do we know how many people lived in ancient societies? Uh, spoiler: We mostly don't. <laughs> But one example is that like a bunch of our ancient sources preserve Roman census statistics. So Livy will tell us like in this year, the census reported this many people. Obviously, we don't have the ancient Roman senatorial archives anymore. We don't have that data. So all we have is Livy's total. Now, Livy had access to the raw census records, which presumably would have been a list of households, uh, a couple hundred thousand of them. Um, with how many members in them by name and their property. God, if we had that, it would be wonderful. We don't. We have Livy's headline number. 
Well, let yeah. me tell you how much better it is to have Livy's headline number than nothing. Yeah, and I suppose, and that's the thing is that we, even when you go down to archaeology and you're looking at the remains of the of buildings, you know, with the best will in the world, if you're looking at a two, two and a half thousand year old, essentially floor plan, if you've got foundations and the initial base of the walls, you can assume that this is a one story building. If you find the remains of a staircase or ladder post, you might say, ah, this is a two story building. But for all you know, it could be a four, six, eight story building. I mean, you know, the number of people in passing i mean okay it's a bit outside of my field but when i mentioned people you know, did you know you know rome had apartment blocks mm -hmm. uh, multi-story apartment blocks that were the fire subject of a lot of um fire insurance fraud and the yes. rich people lived on the bottom <laughs> floor not the top floor uh, which is a complete inverse to what they have these days you know people have this ingrained idea that the ancient world must be one and two story buildings with the occasional parthenon or acropolis poking up above it I was like, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> no, big apartment blocks. You can also sometimes tell by the the width of the foundation mm. that if you've got really big, chunky foundation walls, like they're probably not that way because it was funny. They're probably supporting some. But yeah, yeah. no. And there are a couple of spots in Rome where you might get one or two bottom floors that are all in brick and therefore survive. But there are probably wooden plaster floors above those. Mm. Um you know, your classic two over one or what have you. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, and, and then if you're going to ask like a, a broader question, like, well, what is a Roman neighborhood like? And so on. Well, now you need to compile dozens of excavations of different neighborhoods that are going to give you different evidence and tell you different things. And you're going to need to put them together to generate some kind of, of realistic total picture. And once again, it becomes very painstaking and very slow but it it it's the only way you eventually get to um you know something like to take a very pop culture example something like uh, the fun hbo's rome had mm. in showing roman streets right graffitied and colorful and painted which is accurate like that's correct mm. um you know uh penis graffiti and all mm -hmm. um the the romans were fond of their lewd graffiti um and we have some of it some of it preserved archaeologically and like that kind of thing um all of that has to be built up on on mounds and mounds and mounds of very slow work yeah i do especially love the fact that some parts of pompeii and so forth are like basically cordoned off for the general public because it's felt un un was it unseemly for the tours to include some of the uh, more salacious mosaics and graffiti there in pompeii <laughs> even though you know okay the pictures kind of speak for themselves but at least the written stuff is in latin which the vast majority of the people who are looking at it aren't going to understand read, whereas yeah. you're probably going to see a lot worse on the in or, or similar on the you know interior of a public toilet or down a uh, right. railway tunnel in the modern world I and mean, like, oh no but this is ancient history it must be pure and everybody right. spoke with their these and thous and wherefores and it's like no people are people <laughs> You know, it's funny, one of the things that they used to do, they don't do this anymore, but occasionally you come across old books that do in, you know, back when aristocratic young men in the English speaking world started Latin and Greek when they were like six, um, the primary source text that you'd read your Virgil or what have you from, uh, and particularly this is going to matter for like Horace, Ovid or Catullus, um, the text would be in Latin except that all of the naughty bits would have been translated into Greek from the mm. Latin um, for the schoolboys. The idea being when you were old enough to read both, you were probably old enough to read the naughty bits. And then <laughs> the Greek text would do the same thing in the other direction. Um, it's just absolutely hilarious. Uh, although not entirely unprecedented, um, it's not for concealing the naughty bits, but when Cicero writes his letters home, um, he flips from Latin into Greek when he needs to say sensitive things. He doesn't want the postman to read. Ah, uh -huh. oh, that's clever. <laughs> so he's worried. He's a little worried. And it's, these letters would have been sealed. He's a little worried that his letters might be being opened en route. And he wants to make sure that if the if the courier opens the letter, that the the bit where he's criticizing his political allies or saying that that Julius Caesar fellow's an ass, mm. um, you know, that part maybe they shouldn't read. <laughs> See, and and kind of you know relating that to the sort of the main topic of our 
of our, our discussion, this is kind of the perfect example of why you you need the academic side of things because you know, it, let's assume that someone who's making a video about Cicero and ancient Rome has at least bothered to get a copy and you know a, co a book that's a copy of his correspondence. I mean, with some channels that may be hoping a bit too much, but we, you know we're we're we're, we're, we're the better the better ones at least will have gotten a copy of it. But they're going to get a copy in English, mm -hmm. so they're going to be like, oh, well, he said this and he said this, and he didn't like this person. But it's only someone who's actually looked at the originals, or at least a, a you know a, a, a what would it be? not be a transliteration, but a what's the correct term for a direct copy in the original language? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that is transliteration, isn't it? Yeah, um, which will is most likely going to be an academic who's actually looked at that and gone, ah, but this part is in Latin and this part is in Greek. Greek. And why has he done that? Right. And th that's that like that's the the level of understanding where you actually get you get a, a so much deeper understanding of what's going on and why, um, mm. as compared to just well, this guy thought this, which you know, with the best will of the world, probably a lot of people thought that. <laughs> Um, the fact that he thought it is is neither here nor there, um, right? So, and of course, of... then you have the whole layer of interpretation that is embedded in translation, which is someone who works with non English language sources, like is really significant. Um, translation mm -hmm. choices are are really big, um, and and often translations produced for the public. Um, Especially, you know, if they're not trying to get at the thing you're trying to get at, they can be they can be deceptive. Um, a lot of older translations of of Greek and Latin poetry, Iliad and the Odyssey, or so on, right? You have all of these servants and maids running around. I have to tell students, I'm like, the words in Greek and Latin here are very explicit that these are slaves. These are not like when you think maid, you think someone that's getting paid, and that's not the case. Mm. You know, that's not what this is. You get like. Um, like the Greek oiketai gets translated like household servant, like no, 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 household slave um, is what that means. But like the translation can be, um, I don't want to say deceptive, but it can fool you because of what it's trying to emphasize, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, are, are we trying to explain what this person's job is or their social status? The Greek word has both, but there's no way for English to express both of those together in a single word. And and you can end up with all sorts of, of difficulties like that. I mean, I also come up with a lot of translations, almost all translations of our historical sources. They are not designed with technical military questions in mind. And so the translations of military terms may be, shall we say, loose. Um, and what's a good example? Actually, we can go back to Cicero's letters. There's a letter um, that Cicero gives from Cilicia where he notes that his army is bringing um, uh, a tormenta, um, and that always gets translated as siege weapons, um, like catapults. Mm. And what I would note is that Cicero does not, when he writes that letter, he has no intention of engaging in a siege. Um, this is catapults, but he's intended to use them as field artillery. Tormentum does not mean siege engine. It literally just means the twisted up thing, but it's, it, you might translate it as artillery. Um, or catapult. Mm. Um, it's twisted up because ancient artillery uh, yeah, works on spring ropes. principles. Yeah. <laughs> and um, but he's planning on shooting these at like troops. He's expecting to fight the Parthians. He he doesn't, to his great joy, have to fight the <laughs> Parthians. They would have murdered him. But um, but this is what he's bringing them for. But you could easily sort of misread that translation, well meaning as it is, and misunderstand the technical point being made. And that kind of thing is all over the place uh, if you can't engage it with with the primary language or you can't resort to a scholar who has right because if you go mm -hmm. and get in this case it would be ew marsden's two gigantic volumes on greek and roman artillery then you'll realize what has happened here um those books are not terribly easy to get unfortunately <laughs> um but um but if you're just reading it in an English translation and extrapolating, you might not get it right. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, the whole, this thing with translation, it's a problem all through history. Um, and you can give some examples in the period that my channel covers. Um, one of the issues when 
uh, the UK was thinking about should we go and shoot up the French fleet or not in 1940 was based on they got a copy in French of the armistice between France and Germany. And I mean, it's not the sole reason, but one of the things they had a big problem with was that when they translated it into English, um, one of the clauses read as if it said that the Germans, the, that the, the French ships would sail back to their home ports where they would be under the control of mm. the Germans. That is technically speaking a literal translation, but contextually, at least from what I've been told by people who speak French, it's more of uh, an oversight. It means oversight control rather than, you know, we have people on control, board control. our ships. Um, but in English, they're, you know, they're, they're, those are two very different concepts. In French, it's, you know, there's this one word that could be either way, depending on context, and they went down the wrong route. As I say, it's not the only thing, but the only reason they decided to do Operation Catapult, but that was that was one of the one of the problems and that's something that happened you know in real time um and then uh you had you know if you're looking at uh for example again the age of sail trafalgar um you have french cannon which are um livres the old french unit of weight if you see a 36 livre cannon if you just use your english translation and it says it's a 36 pounder cannon and oh, you go, it's okay, not 30... the same pound exactly it's like it's a 36 pounder british have 32 pounders the difference is four pounds great fantastic but as you just said unless you actually understand old french weights and measures you don't understand that their pound and the british pound is different so the actual equivalent weights are are still further different and you know well while we don't want to to touch on the hot button social topics these days when you go skip back to like the well not necessarily strictly your period but you know, period where you're going to have the more academic understanding than i do um particularly when i think about this whole control issue with the in, in, with mirza el kabir if you read ancient sources the fact that either they will have a term for something we don't have a term for or they will have multiple terms for something we have one term for or they have one term for something we have multiple terms for can be incredibly confusing because you can you can read a sentence like you know uh, this person felt love for this person if it's in greek well great in english everyone's like ah oh, we know what this means but in greek it's like did they feel agape did they feel right. storge did they right. feel philia yep. did they feel eros it's like well, they, 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 there are some options they, there are a lot of options and they mean some very very different things um, and this has been fun example true forever so livy uh you know livy is dealing with in the early parts of his history, older Latin sources than his own. And there is one battle, and I'm not remembering the the exact date. There's one early battle in the Republic where it's he has encountered the word Colossus. And to Livy in the first century, Colossus means fleet. And so he reconstructs the battle as this like naval battle. And it's like Livy, there's a creek. <laughs> There's no water for there to be ships fighting on. But he's like, but the Roman Colossus is fighting the enemy Colossus, so they're ships. What he doesn't know is that the etymology by which Colossus gets to fleet is through its original meaning of army. And that these are land armies. And he's just, because he's several hundred years later, the language has drifted. The further you go into the past from now, the more specialized skills you need to um to understand your your sources there was um oh goodness i i have i have forgotten the name but there was there was one scholarly work on i think it was legal punishments for homosexuality in britain that essentially was entirely premised on a misunderstanding of like 17 and 1800s legal terminology for punishments um and and so, like the book came out and was then demolished because people went out like that's not what that means. Yeah. Um, and you know, uh, again, you know, consult a specialist. Uh, <laughs> and and the further you go back, the tougher that gets, and the more layers you have to go to. Where again, you want to make sure that you're understanding what's in place. And again, like that's what 
the we crusty people in academic departments are for to to know that classes can mean army and so do, do you foresee as time goes on the next few years um do you see more of a crossover hopefully developing between the if you like the public facing the social media side of history and the academic side um or do you think we're going to have kind of trailblazers on both sides trying to make the links and uh, sort of a very uh, sort of a majority entrenched on either side like no this is our this is our little hill we're going to die on it i mean i'd hope that we'd see more crossover but do you think that's realistic i think we will see more i don't know how much more but i think we will see more one thing that is promising on the history side and it is very slowly moving but we are starting to see a sort of recognition that forms of online public engagement can count as a kind of scholarly output, which in the sort of inside baseball of the university matters for how universities do hiring and promotion and blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and it's very uneven right now. Some departments will be very old fashioned and some departments are very forward looking. I think the overall movement in the discipline is trending towards forward looking, but there are the Upper levels of the discipline tend to be dominated by the old guard, but of course they're retiring. Um, you know, this was this was one of the contexts for the whole fight last year about James Sweet's series of pronouncements. He was the president of the HA at the time. Um, he's very much a kind of an old guard scholar who's mildly upset that you know historians like me are on programs like this, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, so I, I think it's changing. I think, unfortunately, the other thing that that almost certainly is going to be the case is that you're going to have, uh, you know, all those history PhDs need to go somewhere. And I think you're going to see more of them working outside of academia simply because they can't get positions in academia. Um, that's going to have negative impacts on on their on their scholarship and their work just because they don't have the resources, the good scholars, but they don't have the resources. But, you know, on the flip side, they're going to be engaging because they have no other choice, um, which I suppose to some degree is the situation I find myself in as well. Um, and and so I, I think the prospects for increased engagement are good. I also think it's necessary. Um, you know, retreating into our crumbling ivory towers is not going to save the discipline. Um, we have to build some degree of public understanding and support for what we're engaged in, in order to alter the vibes, so to speak, that are that are being used as an excuse to to destroy our departments. And in a way, I think that the the very decentralized nature of of how history gets done online in podcasts and videos and so on can actually be a help here because we don't have to go through some giant Netflix studio to do it. Mm. Um, and, and while yes, there is a lot of Drek, there is also a lot of really good material that gets, that gets produced here um, where, you know, there are people making videos who are excited to engage. And this is something that like, I try and communicate with some of my older colleagues that like, I guarantee there is some YouTuber who would love to interview you um you know about this that or the other thing and some folks don't want to do that and i understand it's not part of the training um and they don't feel comfortable with it but i think for those that do i think you will see more movement in that direction yeah i, th I think i think public communication is one of the one of those key things because you know <laughs> The, the 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 two edged sword that is a democratic society. People will advocate for the things that they know, and mm -hmm. you know, again, appealing to my 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 twofold career. It's relatively easy to explain why engineers are valuable, because you can point to the bridge that's just collapsed or the tower that everyone's evacuated from because there's a massive crack in it. Because mm -hmm. you know, nine out of the ten major support stanchions have failed because. They clearly hired a you know a one armed monkey to design in the first place, um, and you can say, look, unless you want that to happen, which like hundreds of thousands of people in this town and city can see, that's why you need people like me five years ago um, <laughs> to make sure it doesn't happen. And everyone's like, yeah, okay, we understand this. This makes a certain amount of sense. Um, but when you say to people, well, you know, we need to maintain 
uh, a, a reasonably sized body of people who are do who are investigating the past and figuring out what might have happened. That's a harder sell for people because people will be like, as you said, they say, well, don't we know that already? Or why is this important to me? Um, I'm not interested, so why should I care? Um, where and you know, again, we're the best one in the world. If if someone publishes a book that sells ten thousand copies and is read by mostly their colleagues, uh, maybe a few more thousand people out there in the world know about that subject and want someone to research more about it. But that's on, in the scheme of things where you've got nations of millions is not going to change much. Whereas, well, ten thousand ten thousand books would be a big print run for an academic volume. Yeah, there you go. Whereas try if six hundred. <laughs> okay, that that's a bit worrying. Uh, but if you if you um, but then at the same time, it's like if you turn around and say, "Well, look, there's someone who's willing to talk to you about your subject," and you know, a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand people will see that, and they'll talk to other people, and you know, suddenly that's gotten a lot more exposure to right, it's a big what's going on. Um, and much as I hate to use the word because it's been horribly abused by a lot of industries, but. You know, unless people know what's happening, they can't support it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I think that this is, I think this is absolutely the case, and and absolutely important. And of course, in the end, like the the answer for why are we doing all of this history stuff hasn't changed in in two thousand four hundred years, right? Thucydides laid out why we're doing this at the beginning that we develop an exact knowledge of the past as a guide to understanding the future. Because the human element remains constant, and so while history doesn't repeat, it reflects itself, it resembles itself. Mm. Or as as Polybius put it, men have no more ready corrective of conduct than knowledge of the past. <laughs> um, and so, you know, this is why why we're doing this. And and I would ask people, you know, you look at the cracks in those buildings. The perceivable consequence is a little harder to track, but as we have defunded humanities education, I would ask people. Does it feel to you like the quality of our leadership has gotten better? <laughs> yeah, I mean, as I've reflected with uh, with a few other people in the past, you know, once you know history, maybe you can persuade people to avoid repeating history. Right. But you know, even if you're not successful in that, if you understand what happened in the past, you can at least learn when to take cover. <laughs> right. <laughs> Run for the hills. Yeah, it's just like um, I can see where this is going. <laughs> Run away! Yeah, uh, I don't know. but um, so I, I suppose today, on a on a slightly lighter note, as we're coming towards the end of this, um, what um, what do you think has surprised you the most about being involved in the more public facing side of history with your blog series, etc.? Uh, that anyone is listening to me. <laughs> um, I I have been sort of surprised and staggered to have, have picked up an audience. I started my project on the assumption that I might end up with a couple hundred readers, most of whom I would know. I have maybe 40 to 50,000 in any given month, which is a lot more than I, I expected. Um, that in turn has opened opportunities for kind of even larger platforms like this one. Um, and and that's been, that's been really shocking to me. Um, it has brought home to me there is a lot of interest, and this is the other thing that I would, you know, I, I tell my my academic colleagues it's like there are people out there who you do not know, who do not know what you do, but are interested in in what you do. If only they knew you were doing it, and if you could get out there and tell them, they they would love to know more. Um, even when, often when you're doing like super technical stuff, like there is interest, and so. You know, make those connections. I think because, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, we talk about the kind of vibes and, and the decline of history. The fact of the matter is most people still recognize that history is important and valuable. The AHA did a survey of Americans a few years back where they asked, do you think learning history is as important as learning engineering and business? And they got like 85% yes. Uh Right. Most people recognize the value of this. They recognize the interest. They recognize the importance. There, There is that interest out there. And what I would say to my colleagues is that like, we just have to, we have to reach out to them. And if 
you, you know, you're the kind of person who doesn't feel comfortable doing that directly. Well, like I have great news for you because there is a reserve army of, of podcasters and YouTubers who are happy to facilitate that process for you. Um, and who would, who would love to hear about your research. Yeah. And I, I would do, uh, yeah, coming at it from the other end, I would definitely second that. I mean, I think anyone with a genuine interest in history, who's doing whatever they is they do, whether it be, you know, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, whatever, if they're putting themselves forward uh, as a historian and they actually genuinely like history and they like the subject they're talking about, they absolutely will want to talk to the academics who they will acknowledge know far more than them in, in their fields. Um, you know, yes, you will have people who are just like, oh, I'm just in it for the money, the content farms, the clickbaity yeah, people. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, you know, yes, they exist. And yes, sometimes they get far more views than they actually deserve. Um, but long term, I think things will, you know, will I, I personally, I'm relatively optimistic that things will win out because, um, you know, people who again, who actually genuinely appreciate history, if they're watching YouTube or whatever social media platform is their choice, they will appreciate that there, there are respected academic figures who have done a lot of research. And if those people are seen to be, you know, saying, yes, this is, this is the case. This is what happened. Here is, here is my presentation on it and collaborating or working with whoever it is they're watching generally that that it kind of works both ways it gives credence to that person because obviously the the academics are not forced to do this they can choose so they don't have if they see someone and they're like oh this channel is rubbish you don't have to talk to them yeah don't go on the channel yeah <laughs> don't mm -hmm. yeah um and and on the flip side isn't that you know when i was at uh, the western naval history association conference back in february you know <laughs> um there's, there's people like norman friedman's there yeah he's written i've probably got like two dozen books written by him and as a naval historian to meet someone who wrote a bunch of the books that i refer to, i'm like this is fantastic i want to be to talk to this guy right um, which was quite funny because the people were like oh drek we, we heard you were here we want to come to meet you and like yeah well hang on a minute i want to go meet yeah this i want guy. to talk to this guy. <laughs> um, and, and, and it's that hierarchy of things so yeah it's like, if if you, there are any other you know academic uh, card carrying academics out there who have a you know, a maritime naval field that they want to talk about or related field you know drop me an email i'd absolutely love to learn more and then because this is the thing ultimately we get into history because we want to learn things and i need to get steven de cassian to talk to you about his project okay. on rams oh that should be fun he has cast a life-size reproduction of one Ooh. of the agati's rams i dread to think how much bronze that cost <laughs> It was a lot. I have no idea how he got funding for it. I, after this, I will shoot him a message and be like, "You should." Anyway. Has, he, has he rammed it into anything yet? Uh, he hasn't, but I think there's some plans to do some testing. It is not attached to a ship, of course, at least at present. Um, but he <laughs> he did he did do it. it it's really a remarkable project. Um, yeah. I keep asking him, like, "Okay, you've done that one. When do I get mine?" <laughs> <laughs> but, really big uh, paperweight. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but um, um, but no, and and the other thing I would say for the for the you know the you know social media and YouTube and so on, uh, you know history disseminators. The other thing I would say is, there's certainly uh, jerks among academics, and we can seem terribly far away. But the fact of the matter is, we usually desperately want to talk to somebody about our research, so. Like chances are, like if you, if you can find the person and and do your homework, find the person that actually does what you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you can find that person, they are often excited to talk about what they're working on. Like that's why we do it. And and you can get, um, you know, you can get interesting feedback. You can get, you know, ye giant pile of bibliography, right? I mean, this is how I respond to my emails. Mm. People are like, what should I read about this? I'm like, well, here's the 20 books. Have fun. Um, but, um, you know, I, I would I would say reach out. Like, we all have emails, and most of our emails are pretty easy to find.
Yeah. So, well, on that positive note, it's pro probably a good point to, to wrap up. Um, thank you very much for, for coming back. I didn't manage oh, to stay you for last me. time. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, th I think we'll probably conclude on, um, just to, for everyone out there, just to emphasize, and this is a, I can't remember exactly who said this, but I know it was, it was a, a professor of some description. Um, the past is what happened. History is our best attempt to work out what the past was. That is still an ongoing process. And that's a process that needs all of us who love history to get involved and and work together in, you know, whether whether we're primarily on YouTube or whether we're primarily in academia, because I think as hopefully you've worked out from listening to us for the past what hour and a half or so, <laughs> it needs both. It, it needs everyone to pitch in to 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 continue developing our understanding. Um, so with we must that, all road together. Yeah, exactly um thanks very much once again and hopefully we'll see you back again on the channel at some point to talk about some more ancient uh ancient history uh because i i i really enjoyed our talk on the punic war and i think a lot of other people did as well so uh see you around everyone Bye. Bye.